some crazy stuff, yo. Years ago, a race of hyper-intelligent, pan-dimensional beings got so fed up with the constant bickering about the meaning of life that they commissioned two of their brightest and best to design and build a stupendous supercomputer to calculate the answer to life, the universe, and everything. Oh, deep thought. We want you to tell us the answer. The answer to what? The answer to life. The universe, everything. We'd really like an answer. Something simple. Hmm, you have to think about that. Return to this place in exactly seven and a half million years. Can we finish? Oh, no, there's more. There's more. They go back. What, seven and a half million years later? That's right. They do. An answer for you? Yes, but you're not going to like it. It doesn't matter. We must know it. All right. The answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything is... Forty-two. Yes, yes, I thought it over quite thoroughly. It is, it's 42. It would have been simpler, of course, to have known what the actual question was. But it was the question. The ultimate question. Of everything. That's not a question. Only when you know the question will you know what the answer means. Give us the ultimate question, then. I can't. But there is one who can. A computer that will calculate the ultimate question. A computer of such infinite complexity that life itself will form part of its operational matrix. And you yourselves shall take on new, more primitive forms and go down into the computer to navigate its 10 million year program. 
I shall design this computer for you, and it shall be called... <laughs> L G B L G B L G B L G B They say L G B everywhere I go L G B what it means I don't know L G B whatever it is LGB, come on, help me, please, please. All righty then. <laughs> Thank you. LGB, that let's go, Brandon. Right? LGB, this means let's go, Brandon. No. LGB, sounds like let's go, Brandon. I guess. LGB, all right. Let's go, Brandon. I am Cornelio. Chant. LGB, right wing and left wing. LGB, go, oh, you know the thing. LGB, if you don't sing, that back. LGB, and you play black. LGB, let's go, Brandon. LGB, let's go, Brandon. LGB, let's go, Brandon. FJB, let's go, Brandon. I'm Joe Biden, and I forgot this message. Greetings, my dear friends, and welcome to another episode of Reading Epic Threads. I'm your host, Patrick Gunnels, joining you this November 27th, 2023 at 9.19 a.m. Central Standard Time. This episode is set to go out on December 1st, 2023. I'll be in Jamaica at the time. It's going to be a short episode. I hope you enjoy, though. It is Martin Getty's Why is the Oblivion Act? condemned to oblivion. Before we get to that, don't forget to go to angelpaste.com. This lotion was invented by my sister Barbara and manufactured by her at her home in Spring, Texas. I was talking to her a couple days ago and I asked her, tell me about this praying thing. Apparently she begins praying the moment she starts making a batch of angel paste and she doesn't stop until she's finished with that batch of angel paste. And I think we have heard, at least some of us, that fluid can have, can be influenced by intention. Water has memory. There's no water in angel paste because water is a drying agent. But when Barbara prays over these things, I think it actually makes a difference. Try it out for yourself. Go to www.angelpaste.com. Use promo code Shapiro to pry a dollar from my grasping hands. And if you order three or more bottles, you get free shipping. Your skin will drink it up. All right, let's begin. This is from Martin Geddes, sorry, newsletter.martingeddes.com. Why is the Oblivion Act condemned to oblivion? It's almost as if there's something the modern powers don't want us to know. By Martin Geddes. If you are watching world events unfold, you are likely to have seen the V for Vendetta masks of Guy Fawkes around, as shown above. It is a frequent quip that Guy Fawkes, who intended to blow up Parliament but got caught, was the last man to enter the place with honest intentions. That said, if the yard in front of Parliament was good enough to hang Guy Fawkes, it could be argued that it would be perfectly appropriate for the modern traitors to have their final moments there too, even if it is an unkind diminution of the reputation of Guy Fawkes by association with absolute scum. While Guy Fawkes got a bad headache way back in 1606, the consequences of the events of the 17th century and later the English Civil War are still very much with us. My previous article, link in the article, introduces the idea of sub-infudation, which is how power is delegated in a feudal society, which we appear to still be, albeit unannounced. It discusses the Act of Indemnity and Oblivion 1660, which consigned the period of the interregnum between monarchies to the memory hole. With this was the recollection that Oliver Cromwell's Commonwealth had given the alloidal title of the land to the people. The Prohibition of Kings Act 1649 was never given royal assent since Charles I had been executed for treason. 
My understanding is that laws passed by Parliament during the period of Cromwell's Commonwealth were considered fully valid nonetheless. The restoration of the monarchy with Charles II was done as a fait accompli, but there was no repeal of this earlier law. Instead, it is somehow deemed nullified, as well as consigned to official oblivion. There is a repeating pattern here of the state picking and choosing which of its own laws it will adhere to. The question that is being raised today is whether the crown is effectively acting as a squatter for nearly four centuries. Who really, really, really owns England? On what basis is the modern state claiming a right to charge men and women money to exist on their own land and seek shelter? It is sometimes asserted that Ted Heath and Queen Elizabeth II committed treason with our accession to the European economic communi community, nullifying all since. Could this be true going as far back as the middle of the 17th century? Are any of our modern governmental institutions founded on a fully lawful basis? Now, I am not an historian or a legal scholar, so I cannot confirm or deny this hypothesis that our constitutional foundations have a subsidence problem that goes back many centuries. However, I do like to do my own research, so I look for this Indemnity and Oblivion Act 1660 on the government legislation website. It wasn't there. Nor is the 1649 Act that, act that bans kings, which has never been repealed. This is a big deal, as the whole of our modern society is based on the constitutional settlement that came out of the English Civil War, e.g. Act of Settlement 60, 1662, Sestui Qui V Act 1666, Bill of Rights 1688. That might be Sestui Qui Vi Act or Sestui Qui VA Act 1666. I never took Latin. So I wrote to the National Archives who manage legislation.gov.uk to ask why. My letter, quote, Dear Sir or Madam, while the events around the English Civil War may seem remote to us, we continue to live with many of the same legal, moral, and political struggles. I have been researching the era and noticed that the Act of Indemnity and Oblivion 1660 appears to be missing from your legislation archive. Can you help me understand whether this is a known limit of your scope, an error, or something else? Kind regards, Martin Geddes. I have received the following response. Quote, thank you for your inquiry. I'm afraid the legislation you request is not available in a web publishable format. The most likely reason for this is that you are looking for an old legislation item that was repealed before our base date of 1991, or was for some other reason not included in the earlier hard copy editions of the revised statutes. We are currently working to add to the website scanned original text PDFs for English, GB, and UK acts dating from 1225 and for printed UK statutory instruments dating from 1945. Unfortunately, we have yet been able to locate a copy of this particular act and therefore cannot give a specific timeline of when this work will be completed. However, we are adding these as and when they become available. In the meantime, you may be able to obtain a printed copy from the British Library, which runs a photocopying service of official publications, including legislation, which they hold, or try the Parliamentary Archives website, parliament.uk, email archives at parliament.uk. By way of background, legislation.gov.uk carries most but not all, types of legislation and their accompanying explanatory documents. For a full list of legislation types held on legislation.gov.uk, see Browse Legislation. For information about the legislation we do hold and why some legislation is not available, please see this link and this link. The website also provides information which may help you to fund the legislation that you want from alternative sources. All right, link here. If your query relates to something that you think might be held in the records of the National Archives, then you need to submit your request choosing Make an Enquiry button on the following web page. I hope this is of assistance. End quote. To be fair, this is not a complete brush off. So the respondent has done the job, yet it is also concerning. 
We are 25 years into the internet revolution, 20 years after the mass rollout of fixed broadband, and 15 years into smartphones. Shouldn't we by now at least have a definitive list of the legislation passed by our parliament, even if the text of some more obscure orders has yet to be digitized? And shouldn't a critical act that establishes the very foundation of our modern system of constitutional monarchy and affects the title to all the land in England be instantly available in final form to all, its absence almost says more than its content. The erasure of our legal and constitutional history is not a minor thing. In America, there is a controversy over the true nature of the 13th Amendment as relates to titles of nobility. This could come back to bite those who, in the present era, have sworn an oath to a foreign legal guild, the Bar Association, or taken on a title that might deny them American citizenship if enforced. I do not wish to take a position on the matter, but merely note that the lack of a definitive and non-repudiable list of laws is something of great importance. Maybe someone has something to hide when it comes to English law and our civil rights. The only way this laxity over our history and rights will change is if we become active and demand it. Maybe if you are a British citizen, you want to let them know, link in the article, that you consider it a priority to have a complete collection online of all laws and documents that are foundational to our modern rule of law. We celebrate the demise of Guy Fawkes every year on the 5th of November, so clearly we have a cultural desire to preserve the memory of events of that era. Is it true that Cromwell was just a cover for the hunting down of the true royal bloodlines of Britain? Why was Charles I, even if a bit nasty, the last monarch to support the right of Englishmen to bear arms? Could it be the case that Charles II was just a Vatican-aligned stooge installed by the bankers who stole England? Is today's Charles III even a living and legitimate king of England? Does someone else have a rightful claim to the throne? Is the crown just a proxy for foreign powers in the city of London and the Vatican? Did it all go wrong for the English way before with the Norman invasion? Who paid for William the Conqueror to conquer the English? I am sure the modern powers will have no objection to such a laudable goal of rescuing our constitutional history from oblivion. After all, not as if they're covering up the greatest acts of treason in our nation's history, right? Right? And that is our friend Martin Geddes. Go to newsletter.martingeddes.com. Go to martingeddes.com slash support. To throw a few shekels Martin's way, who gave up his extremely lucrative career as a telecommunications guru to fight corruption wherever it might be found. martingeddies.com slash support, newsletter.martingeddies.com. All right. And just a reminder, my friends, go to angelpaste.com. Dot com, the best lotion in the world. My sister invented it. She manufactures it at her home. It consists only of food-grade plant oils, and she prays the entire time she is making this amazing product. Go to angelpaste.com. Use promo code Shapiro to pry a dollar from my grasping hands. And if you buy three or more bottles, you get free shipping. Angel Paste, your skin will drink it up. All right, I'm going to read to you something to promote a podcast uh, from the brilliant James Dellingpole. Uh, and this will be self-explanatory, and then I'll wrap up the show. From dellingpole.substack.com, finally, my podcast with a satanic mother of darkness by James Dellingpole. Finally, I've posted up the strangest, most disturbing, and compelling podcast I've ever recorded. The one with former mother of darkness, Jesse Zebotar. Perhaps I should have accompanied it with a health warning. There are lots of reasons why I hesitated before releasing the recording. Is Jessie for real? Or is she a fraud? Is she a genuine Christian or part of some kind of New Age Luciferian trap? How much of her extraordinary story can we believe? But the re main reason it took me so long is simply this. It freaked me out and gave me nightmares and told me stuff I'm not sure I wanted to know. 
As she explains in the podcast, Jesse Zebotar was selected at a very early age as a candidate to become a Satanist high priestess known as a mother of darkness. She qualified, she claims, because she was descended from a number of bloodline families and because she demonstrated the psychic powers which enabled her to communicate with demonic forces, including Satan. And that's just the beginning of her tale. It gets much weirder, much darker, as she describes the satanic rituals in which she was forced to participate, including ones involving the rape, torture, and murder of small children. Zebotar names names, most of which, for obvious reasons, I've had to cut out. But if you want the short version, it goes like this. Almost every famous person in the world is quite literally working for the devil. Presidents, pop idols, movie stars, central bankers, duh, obviously, senior politicians, royals, etc. If you know their name, they are in the game. Or so Sebotar says, but it could be all made up or heavily embroidered or completely terrifyingly true. I honestly don't know the answer because by its very nature, this alleged insider information is all but impossible to verify. I mean, if many of the world's most famous people really are practicing Satanists and have been since forever, they must have got very good at hiding the fact. And presumably, there are terrible penalties for anyone who recants and spills the beans, which does rather make you wonder how come Sebotar is still around, breaching the Illuminati Omerta, unless you accept her explanation that it's because she is protected by God. Anyway, as always with my podcasts, I leave it up to you, the viewer and listener, to make up your own mind. For the most part, I just sit there gobsmacked while Sebotar tells me her story. As anyone familiar with my podcasts ought to be aware by now, I don't much like arguing with my guests unless they really, really annoy me. I've never been a fan of the adversarial approach taken by organizations like the BBC. Generally, I prefer these encounters to be conversations rather than interrogations. I like my guests to be as comfortably as comfortable as they possibly can be while giving them enough rope to hang themselves, should that be what they wish to do. Some people I know will get angry at me for not pressing Sepotar hard enough or for releasing the podcast at all. But I do wonder why, whether there might be an underlying reason for that. You see, while I'm fairly sure that not everything Sebotar says can possibly be true, how do fallen angels still get to wander in and out of heaven? How do mothers of darkness gain access, even telepathically, to God's throne room? I think there's just too much authentic detail for it all to have been made up. Let's remind ourselves of some of the things we do know. Ritual satanic abuse definitely exists. Child trafficking is one of the world's biggest and lucrative, most lucrative industries. Both Hollywood and the music industry appear to require their stars to make pacts with the devil and show their allegiance to him by flashing Illuminati symbols in promo videos and such like. Adrenochrome is not a conspiracy theory. Pedophilic sex videos and worse are commonly used to blackmail senior politicians into compliance. It accords with scripture too. As St. Paul tells us in his second letter to the Corinthians, the devil is the god of this world. So all Sebotar is doing is fleshing out in often quite remarkable detail stuff we already know to be true. And I think sometimes when people respond dismissively to testimony like Sebotar's, they are using their annoyance and skepticism as a psychological comfort blanket. That is, they are naturally so upset as we all are by the thought of what appears to children in those satanic ceremonies that they find it easier simply to shoot the messenger. I said at the beginning that I felt Sebotar had told me stuff I wasn't sure I wanted to know. But isn't that part of the problem with horrors like child trafficking, adrenochrome harvesting, and ritual satanic abuse? It's so truly hideous, we'd rather look away and pretend it didn't exist. We put our own mental security, in other words, before the interests of all those tortured children. That may be the easier path, but I don't think... It's the right one. 
So everybody go to dellingpoll.substack.com. Right now, that podcast is available only to paid subscribers. I am a paid subscriber, so I will be listening to it today. Uh, so by the time you watch this, I will have listened to it. Uh, and so go there. It, it, all of his podcasts end up becoming free at some point. Just saying, you know, I'd like to promote his work uh, as much as possible. He's one of those people out there in the world who comes from the mainstream media world, who's authentic, real, on our side, looking for the truth. So go to Dellingpoll. That's D-E-L-I-N-G-P-O-L-E dot substack dot com and subscribe today if you can. And as a follow-up, I'm going to read you some stuff from Vox Day, uh, which is how I found out about this, this uh, podcast. This from voxday.net is entitled Dellingpole and the Demons. And so in response to what Dellingpole just wrote, Vox Day says, what I find fascinating about those who deny the biblical description of our fallen world, and even most self-professed Christians do, is the way in which even when people who have taken the ticket, who have participated in the rituals, and who are openly testifying to what they have witnessed, the default position is to claim that the world cannot possibly be otherwise than it is described on television. Whether or not Dellingpole's guest is telling the truth or is merely another psychological operation meant to discredit those who are correct, who correctly perceive the evils of this world is irrelevant. The more you simply open your eyes and observe without prejudice or preconception, the more you will see and understand. The fools of the world love to declare there is no evidence even when they are staring directly at irrefutable and conclusive proof. But the weight of the evidence, when seen through the lens of history, is absolutely staggering, and the provable fact of the matter is that nearly everything you were taught, from the innocent English settlers being forced to seize land from savage Indian tribes, to the need to drop atomic bombs to force the Japanese to surrender, to the assassination of President Kennedy, to Iraqi weapons of mass destruction, to the inevitable Ukrainian victory in the Donbass, has been an absolute lie. If, at this point, you don't believe still in evil, real, spiritual evil, that acts in the material world as described in the Bible, you are consciously averting your eyes. All right, my friends, we're going to make this a short reading Epic Threads today, just under 30 minutes total. And of course, I'm cranking these bad boys out in preparation for my honeymoon. If you'd like to really make your skin thank you, go to angelpaste.com, use promo code Shapiro to pry a dollar from my grasping hands. My sister prays over every single bottle the entire time she's making the entire batch, guys. Amazing stuff. Uh, because the recipe is completely secret, all we know for sure is that it is nothing but food-grade plant oils, nothing that your skin doesn't want. Uh, she put, she posts exactly why she doesn't publish her recipe or her ingredient list, and she's got great reason not to, guys. Intellectual property is not protected in the United States of America or in this world, for that matter. Uh, but you will find that it does wonders for you. Go to angelpaste.com, use promo code Shapiro, buy three or more bottles and you get free shipping. Your skin will drink it up. All right, wrapping this bad boy up. Hopefully do another one today to get us a little further along towards covering my entire honeymoon. Let us pray. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. I love you all. Thank you so much for being here, and I will see you tomorrow. I will be the greatest president that God ever created.